Well, thank you all very much uh, for being here, and I appreciate this opportunity. Um, and like uh, Dave said, I, I do have two overseas um, technically combat deployments, but none of that prepared me for driving through Philly. <laughs> it routed me through uh, literally one-way streets past Temple University. It said uh, it was the fastest way here. I guess the freeways were jammed. So. But I made it, and of course, my mom's visiting from California, and I said, Mom, do you want to go hear about the Crimean War? And God bless her, she said, okay. <laughs> um, so some of the stuff that uh, I'll mention today is very relevant because it's, it's in the headline news. Uh, there's a lot of the questions of this war are still very much unresolved and uh, may not end up being resolved for quite a while. But leaving the 21st century behind, the mid-19th century was very, very different. Um, and there's about a 10-year period, 1850 through 1860, where arguably military technology, tactics, capabilities experienced a massive leap. And the Crimean War and our American Civil War happened right around this time, where technology and things are changing so fast that the military leadership have a hard time catching up. But there's interesting links between what went on in the Crimean War uh, and the American Civil War, and that's why I use this photo as, uh, as an example. So these are British, uh, British Army soldiers circa 1856, and they're armed with the pattern 1853 Enfield rifle musket, which started uh, entering British Army service uh, in the Crimea in, uh, in the front lines in early 1855. And the United States color troops photograph taken from during the American Civil War, circa 1864, they are armed with the same rifle. Those are English-made infield pattern 1853 rifle muskets. Uh, so a, a tangible link to the, the old world British Army and, uh, of course, our Civil War. Okay. All right, so here's what we'll cover. I won't belabor the contents very long. But the Crimean War in, in 60 or 120 seconds. Uh, it is the first major European war since Napoleon. So everyone is paying attention to what's going on here. There's a lot of new weapons and new technology, uh, new things that had been fielded that had not yet been tried in active military affairs. There was the revolutions of 1848, but those weren't state-on-state -state wars. The little Schleswig War, but no great power wars. And the causes of the war are far too complex to go into here, but broad brush, big picture. Russia is a rising power, and the Ottoman Empire, which is in the green on the map, the Ottoman Empire is, is starting a period of increasingly accelerating decline. And uh, Russia is expanding. Russia wants warm water ports. Their goal eventually is to make it to Constantinople, which they have already tentatively renamed to Tsargrad. Uh, but in, in the 1850s, uh, the Russians began uh, expanding into what was Ottoman territory. In July of 1853, they crossed the border. They occupy what is now modern-day Romania, the Danubian provinces, uh, up in the lighter green portion. And tensions start to build, and ultimately it, it leads to the Ottoman Empire declaring war on Russia in October of 1853. And this uh, will eventually drag uh, France and Great Britain into the war. Uh, there's several major battles, uh, but uh, the French and the British end up moving their armies to the Crimean Peninsula. There are some other peripheral uh, combat operations, but for the most part, the, the war occurs on the Crimean uh, Peninsula there in the Black Sea. And a lot of this stuff you'll see in the headlines today, unfortunately. Oh, down button. So the French, the British, and Ottoman forces form what they called the Allies, and uh, they landed in Crimea. The French and British sent their armies. Uh, they engaged in several conventional stand-up field battles, uh, first at the Alma, then at Balaclava, and then at Anchorman. Russia loses all three of these major battles, and after that point, the Russians decide we are going to fall back to our fortified city of Sevastopol and try to ride out the war there turns into a siege. The siege lasts uh, many months, but finally the Allies take Sevastopol, 
there's a victory, and there's 20 years of peace in Europe after this, among the great powers, the Russians and Ottomans go back to war. And there's some other peripheral events, but again, it's primarily focused in the Crimean Peninsula. And the Crimean War takes place during this period of extraordinarily rapid technological change. So we're seeing, not just in military affairs, but in, in life in general, this rapid change uh, in, in the speed of communications, telegraphs, uh, steamships, greater sanitation, all of these advancements, uh, even in the textiles and production and manufacturing, all of these translate also into greater military capability. So Napoleon, for instance, 50 years before, could only field an army of a fairly modest size by modern standards, or even by Civil War standards. Uh, by the 1850s, when you start having railroads and uh, machine production, you can field a much larger army. Uh, you can ship the food to them faster. You can keep the ammo coming in faster. So this, this rise of industry in the Industrial Revolution means that your armies can be larger and much more capable. They're a lot easier to equip and supply, and the weapons are also getting more advanced. So they're much more powerful, much more advanced. And all of this means what happens in the Crimean War is in many, in many cases, would never have been possible only 10 or 20 years uh, earlier. So one example that would carry on into the Civil War uh, of the, the new technology that we're seeing during this, this period is a gun called the Pikesan gun. And I practiced that translation <laughs> or pronunciation quite a bit. If you know a better uh, pronunciation, let me know. But he was a French officer. And what he developed uh, in the 1820s is a cannon that can fire a high-velocity shell that is explosive. So it's firing a, what we would consider a modern exploding shell. And the French poet Victor Hugo uh, even wrote back in the 1820s, he says, Earth, the shell is God, and Pekson is his prophet. Uh, the design of the gun, you can see that it is larger and heavier at the breech where the highest pressures are from firing. And you might be familiar, uh, we'll get to it a little later, there's a Civil War gun that uses that same principle. But he designed the gun and the shell, it uses a wooden sebo shoe, which prevents the shell from being shattered by the, the impact of firing. But the shell ignites when the gun fires, so you don't have to worry about lighting any fuse. You just load the thing, point it at what you want to blow up, fire it, and it launches a very large, very heavy, thin-walled shell. So the walls of the shell are fairly thin, which means you can put a lot more gunpowder into the hollow space. And these get developed in the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, and everyone starts to adopt them, and no one really knows how they will work until... The Battle of uh, Sinope, which was the, or Sinope, the Greek pronunciation. Today it's the city of Sinop in northern Turkey. So the Russians, when they uh, go to war with the Ottoman Empire, uh, the war breaks out in October of 1853. So the Ottomans declare war on the Russians for crossing over into their provinces. And Europe yawned because the Ottoman Empire and Russia are fighting battles rather frequently. They go to war from time to time. It's, it's quite common. And the Russians are making incremental advances. And that's starting to disturb the Metternichian balance of power after the, the Napoleonic Wars. But they go to war in 1853, and Europe, for the most part, kind of yawns because Russia is seen as technologically backwards, and the Ottoman Empire is seen as technologically backwards. But Russia has a fleet on the Black Sea, and the ships are steam-powered, so they can steam where they will, regardless of the wind, and they have the Pikeson guns on them. And so they engage an Ottoman flotilla at Sinope in uh, November of 1853. And the Russians lost 37 men. And the Ottomans are on the side where the artist used all the cadmium red. Because these shells blasted through the walls of the Ottoman fleet, and the fleet, the Ottoman ships were sailing vessels, so they couldn't just steam away. Uh, 
there's no wind. And the Russian fleet can approach at exactly the right course, and they engaged uh, this Ottoman squadron and annihilated it. And this overnight gives Russia control over the Black Sea. And everyone realizes right away wooden warships at this point are now obsolete. So this is 1853. Everyone has these pikes on shell guns. And now every single Navy has guns that can blow up the other side's guns uh, or other side's ships. So it's, it's one of the instances where naval firepower leaps ahead of what would become armored defenses later on. But the French and the British, who were not ordinarily uh, on the same side, they're not typically uh, in the 19th century considered to be allies, but the fear of Russia with naval control of the Black Sea being able to possibly stage landings in Bulgaria or uh, use their sea power to occupy more and more of the Ottoman territory, the French and the British overcome their differences to join up to prevent Russia from uh, getting access mostly to the Mediterranean. And the, the technical cause of the war was they opposed to uh, the Tsar of Russia declaring himself the protector of Christians in the Ottoman Empire. But the real reason for the war was they wanted to stop, stop Russian expansion. We don't want Russian warships and Russian merchant ships competing against France and Britain in the Mediterranean. Now there's one problem. The French and the British have the fleet. The British have the Royal Navy, incredibly powerful. The Russian or the French Navy is less powerful, but not far behind, but they all have wooden ships. So the ideal solution to stop Russia would be to send our fleets to Crimea, which is the main Russian port, either blockade it or capture it, and that's gonna shut down any Russian hopes of expanding further south. But Russia has these Pikesong guns in their fortresses. And in naval warfare, especially in the 19th century, fort beats ship every time because the fort doesn't sink. And they've got Pikesong guns there. So if the Royal Navy or the French Navy steam up to bombard these forts, they're going to fare no better than the Ottomans did. So can you, you might see what's coming next, what technique that they uh, turn to to prevent these explosive shells from busting through the wooden sides of their warships. So this is a French ironclad or an iron cased ship as they were known in, uh, in the early 1850s. And this was simply designed as a floating battery and it has a steam engine in it because the Russians have the pikes on shells those will knock down your sails and your masts if you try to approach with a conventional sailing vessel. But if you've got a steam engine on your ship, you can steam that thing up where you want it. And if you have iron armor on the sides of your ship, you are more or less impervious to that return fire. So that's exactly what they did. They slapped on iron plate onto these batteries and uh, they, they were very effective. Um, and they could engage fortresses. Note the very slight angle of the sides of the armor. And uh, a f only a few years later, only about seven odd years later, the Confederates are going to copy this concept and build their own floating battery. They, they called it the warship, the CSS Virginia. But it was in all intents and purposes uh, a, a iron cased floating battery. Steam power by itself gives you uh, great potential because you now have freedom of navigation regardless of the wind. Only 10, 15 years earlier, you did not know. If you loaded up your ship with supplies and you sent it, say you're the British Empire and you want to send a ship to India, you can have a ballpark idea of when that ship is going to get there, but you don't really know for sure because you don't know what the winds are going to be like on the way. And steam power gives you that freedom of navigation. It also means you can load much heavier cargoes. You can mount heavier guns and uh, supplies on your ships for longer distances, and they get there a lot faster. You can start to predict. As a logistician, knowing when your supplies are going to get there is as important as getting the supplies ready to get there in the first place. So this enables you to predict and, uh, and move things knowing when they're going to get there rather than being dependent on the wind. 
and probably most importantly, this is where the new industrial capability influences military capability, is that now you can sustain, you can take your army for the first time in military history. This, this is revolutionary. You can grab your army, put them on ships, move them thousands of miles away from your country, land them there, fight a war there, and supply that army with steamships. This is something that had never been seen before until the Crimean War. So the French and the British do just that. They load their armies onto ships and they steam them thousands of miles down through the Mediterranean Sea, up into the Black Sea. They set up a, a jumping off point in Bulgaria, which then was Ottoman territory, friendly territory. Then they launched into the Crimea. They landed, they fought three uh, field battles against Russia, and then they laid siege to the main Russian naval base in uh, the Black Sea, which was Russia's only warm water port. So this is Russia's main military naval base. France and Britain are besieging it, supplying everything completely by sea. But once you get to the Crimea, so you offload all your stuff. They've had a, a base, the British naval logistics base was in Balaclava. And they offloaded all of their stuff from their ships at the wharf. And tragically, a lot of the supplies ended up rotting there, and their soldiers are eight miles away in the trench lines. Uh, in many cases, starving. They don't even have wood for, um, for making cooking fires. The winter of 1854 uh, was incredibly brutal. Just like in the Civil War, many times more British soldiers died of disease and exposure uh, than from combat wounds. So the British, you can see the red line around the outer uh, perimeter of Sevastopol. Those were the Allied trench lines. So the French are on the left side and the British are on the right. And the blue inner line, those were the Russian lines around Sevastopol. And then down there in the south, you can see the dashed line. That is the port of Balaclava. And that is only eight miles away. And they, during the winter of 1854, they had the supplies, warm weather clothes, or uh, winter clothes, shoes. Uh, all their supplies were down there, and that road turned into just a, a muddy river. And they were having to rely on animals or Turkish soldiers to carry supplies up. So the trench lines were absolutely miserable. The winter of 1854... 55, uh, the, the British barely climbed on. The British had to beg the French, who managed a little bit better during this, they begged the French to borrow mules to carry their dead back down to uh, Balaclava. Uh, one interesting, uh, the British wanted to send soldiers coffee to the siege lines, but you cannot send roasted coffee in the 1850s because it tends to want to mold very quickly. But you can send green coffee beans. So there's several instances of British soldiers freezing. In many cases, they're burning their boots to stay warm. It was that bad. And then they get this shipment of supplies up from Balaclava, and it is green coffee. And they don't even have wood to roast the coffee. It's like uh, adding insult to injury. But 1855... Railroads are, uh, are popping up all over Europe and in the United States. So the British built the world's first military railroad ever. And it was the Grand Crimean Central Railway. And I already gave away how long it was. The Grand Crimean Central Railway was about eight miles long. But that railroad, once it was complete, finally allowed the enormous amount of supplies from Balaclava to flow up to sustain the siege lines. And it was the the fire of the large siege guns that ground down the Russian defenders, uh, and they fired 2.4 million shells. This was the British fired 2.4 million shells over the course of the siege, and all that came up through this railroad. So that the, the heavy volumes of fire to reduce the Russian fortifications would not have been possible without that railroad. And then here's my bread and butter, uh, the introduction of the rifle. 
from 1845 back 200 some years, the weapon of uh, the soldier in Western countries is the smoothbore musket. In the late 1830s, or early 1840s, they start to adopt the percussion musket, but the gun is still a smoothbore. There's no rifling in the barrel. So battle takes place with infantry soldiers. Battle occurs between uh, 150 yards at a maximum range and up until bayonet point. That is infantry battle range. Beyond 150, 200 yards is artillery distance. Uh, infantry with muskets, just you're not going to hit anything at two, 300 plus yards with the smoothbore musket. Suddenly, in the mid 1840s, and especially around 1849, uh, all of this changes. When uh, someone you've probably heard of, the French, uh, French instructor at Vaisson, named Claude Etienne Minier, invents a bullet that can be loaded as quickly and easily as the old smoothbore musket round. But this expands and takes the spin of rifling automatically. The soldier doesn't have to do anything else to it. So it means you can load a rifle as quickly as you can load and fire the smoothbore musket. And now, theoretically, the power of infantry is extended from a maximum of 150 yards to if you train your soldiers how to aim and apply all of what we would call today you know, basic rifle marksmanship fundamentals. You can reasonably engage a man-sized target out to about four or 500 yards and formation-sized targets out to 900 yards. So I have a uh, pattern 1851 Minier rifle and the sights go up to a very optimistic 1,000 yards. But that was, if you have a battalion of 1,000 soldiers and you see a column of Russians six, seven, 800 yards away, you can put fire with infantry on that enemy formation. And this is unheard of in the, in the 1850s and before for 200 years. So this is the paradigm of infantry combat, of how things work on the battlefield, how the three branches operate, infantry, cavalry, artillery. This is upside down. And now infantry suddenly has this massive unforeseen power that it did not have before. Uh, with, the only, with the asterisk I would add to that, trained infantry. So the British established in 1853, the same year that uh, they adopt the pattern 53 infield rifle. They open up a school of musketry to train the modern soldier. We don't think twice now about uh, new soldiers. They go to the recruiter, they join the army, and we ship them off to basic training for like three months. And we teach them how to maintain and use their weapon systems. That's kind of obvious. A smoothbore musket, you can train a soldier everything he needs to know about loading and firing a smoothbore musket in about eight minutes. You just pour the powder in, ram it down, and put a cap on it, and you're good to go. You pull the trigger when the officer says fire. But a rifle, now you have sights on the rifle. You have to learn to line them up. You have to pull the trigger slowly. You can't just jerk the trigger back or you're going to send your shot off into space. And most importantly, you have to know how far away your enemy is and estimate the distance. That's what they are doing here. They're, they're learning to set their sights. You can see the sight flipped up on the back of their rifles. And these soldiers are being trained how to set the sights for various distances on the battlefield. So it does no good if you have a rifle where you can set the sights for 500 yards, but you stand there and you don't know how far away an enemy soldier at 500 yards looks like, the rifle's not going to be very much good to you. So they start training up these soldiers to use the modern weapon. And the British in the Crimea uh, demonstrate the power of the rifle very effectively. The French, not so much. The French took a little bit more of a pragmatic approach where we don't want to give every single soldier a rifle. And then when they finally did give them rifles, they didn't give them the complex rear sight. The French were very much more focused on retaining the bayonet as their uh, chief weapon. But the British went all in. They dove in feet first with training soldiers. We will defeat enemies on the future battlefield using bullets rather than bayonets, which 
we kind of just take that as a matter of fact today that you know we soldiers fight with bullets. In 1853, that was by no means determined, and the British were one of the first that says we will fire uh, at long ranges. So during these opening three battles of the Crimean War, the rifle-armed British infantry were incredibly effective because these guys had been trained. They had received training uh, in Malta and again in Bulgaria. After the land in Crimea, they're still brushing up on it. So when they finally engage the Russians, the Russians who are all armed with smoothbore muskets and they're using smoothbore tactics, very Napoleonic, you pack your soldiers into columns and you attack in column. At the Battle of Anchorman, the Russians attack and the British open fire at five, 600 yards and there was a journalist, William Howard Russell, uh, from the London Times, one of the first war correspondents. Uh, and this is one of the first wars where there were journalists actually embedded with the armies. And you have a telegraph, so you can send battle reports back in almost real time. The, the next day or the next couple days, when your steamship makes it back down to Constantinople, and you can snap off a telegram back to London, your report can appear in the news only a few days later, which is incredibly fast for the 1850s. But he watched the British infantry fire on the Russian advances at Inkerman, and they had never seen anything like it before. The Russians were going down at 600 yards away, which before was only artillery could do that. And William Howard Russell famously said, it looked like the invisible hand of the destroying angel was just knocking the Russians over. At, uh, at 600 yards, absolutely unprecedented, which would make a dandy name for a book, The Destroying Angel. Um, and I have some here on the table if you're interested. Um, but you probably heard uh, at the Battle of Balaclava in October of 1854, you've probably heard of something called the Charge of the Light Brigade. That's what most people are familiar with, the Battle of Balaclava, where the British cavalry of the Light Brigade very famously charged into Russian guns, a big blunder, they got chopped up. But also, during the Battle of Balaclava, something else happened. This is the 93rd Highlanders under uh, General Colin Campbell. And they were also attacked by Russian cavalry at the Battle of Balaclava. And uh, this part of the Crimea is very open and rather barren. There's not a lot of uh, brush or any, any other cover. And they are in line. And there are Russian batteries up on the heights looking down at them. And then there is Russian cavalry. And they have to stand here because behind them is the port of Balaclava, where all the British supplies are. So if Colin Campbell abandons this post, the Russians can swoop down and capture the main base for the, the British. So he has to stand here. And the Russian cavalry see him in line. And they... They know under the 19th century paradigm of war, under anything Napoleon would have known, these guys are in big trouble because they're infantry and they're facing Russian cavalry and Russian artillery. So if you are infantry and you want to defend against cavalry, you would form square. It's where you take all your soldiers, you pack them into a tight little box. The front rank kneels down. They plant the butt of the bayonet in the ground. And the horse being not particularly a stupid animal, doesn't want to charge itself into that wall of bayonets. So if you form square, you're generally safe. But if you stay in square, now you're a dandy target for that Russian artillery. They can take round shot cannonballs and just bounce them through your dense compacted formation. So if you form square, he's a beautiful target for the artillery. The artillery will knock him over. And if he stays in line, where the artillery can still fire at you, but they're not going to come through dense square formations. If you stay in line, now you're vulnerable to cavalry. Because if cavalry charges you, your smoothbore musket is good to about 100 yards, and you only have time, you have one shot. And you can imagine yourself, if you're a soldier on the Napoleonic battlefield, and you're standing there, you've got a smoothbore musket with one shot in it, and you see cavalry coming at a full gallop. And cavalry often wore outlandish, bright uniforms, big hats, pikes and sabers, and the ground starts to shake as the cavalry approaches. And you've got one shot. That shot probably is not going to be very effective. So the cavalry see them in line and think, we've got them. And the Russian cavalry start to advance. And you don't charge at the full-on gallop. 
to start off with. To start off with, you trot and gradually build that speed. And that last 100 yards, you break into the full charge. So they're slowly cantering towards the British. And they see the British, the line, aimed and fired. And then they heard the bullets hitting. This was at 600 yards. That unnerved the Russians. They kept advancing, though. Campbell's soldiers reloaded. They fired a second volley at 300 yards. This time it was much more effective, and the Russians realized we either have to commit or we got to get out of here. They decide to go for it. They charge, and he delivers the last volley at 150 yards, approximately. In the painting, this is a very famous painting. In the painting, they got within like six feet, but historically, at 150 yards, that third volley shattered them, and the cavalry broke off, veered, and turned away. So this went down. That same uh, journalist, William Howard Russell, called them a thin red streak tipped with steel, but it has gone down as the thin red line, which you, you might have heard of. Again, battle turned upside down. On the same day, another British officer uh, with the rifle brigade engaged a Russian artillery battery at 600 yards and silenced the battery with infantry with muskets. So this has never been, never been seen or even conceived of. So this is what the Russians end up resorting to very successfully after these three field battles. Alma, Balaklava, Anchorman, and the Russians decide we cannot go on the field and defeat the invading French and British armies. So they fall back into a siege at Sevastopol with uh, field fortifications. Now, f uh, earthworks are nothing really new, but they developed them around, a uh, around Sevastopol to an extent that had not really yet been seen in warfare. The British have rifles. They have rifled artillery. They have much larger guns that have been used in war, and the, the British and French are being well supplied from their home countries with steam power and railroad power. So the Russian earthworks had to be very well, uh, very large to absorb that fire. I have another picture here. This, I, when I first saw this, I thought this was from the Civil War. And then that's why I chose this photo. I'm thinking, where is that? Is that Centerville? Is that Fairfax? Is that somewhere on the peninsula? And then it's like, no, that's, that's the Redan at Sevastopol, because it looks so much like Civil War, like Petersburg, something out of Petersburg. And the damage that was done to these earthworks, unlike masonry forts, the earthworks, you can shoot at them all day with your heavy guns, and you can bust out a breach in them. And overnight, you can hear the enemy repairing it. And the next day, you wake up, and the hole that you had spent all day before is now just patched up. And assaulting these earthworks are incredibly costly because you have to get through the ditch, up to the parapet. The enemy have rifles. They have very large guns, interlocking fields of fire. So the, the British and the French settled down for a siege, uh, bombarded them constantly, and then uh, finally did take the works uh, by assault at the end of many months of siege. Now, the Crimean War being the first major European war in 40 years with all this new technology and all these new reports coming out of uh, Crimea, uh, the, the, the mini ball, the mini rifle, is already becoming a household word in the United States years before the Civil War because it is, it's, it's like the coolest, most modern infantry. Uh, it's like the new 6.8 millimeter guns the Army is, is working on, like latest cutting edge, super, super cool military technology. Um, and we decide, we being the United States, Secretary of War Jefferson Davis, like we need to get in on this and figure out what is going on. So a commission of three officers was hand selected. Each one was a, a specialist in their own field. And this photo you have Major Mordecai, who uh, is an ordnance officer, coordinates. Then uh, the next, uh, from left to right, so there's Major Mordecai, and then there's a Russian courtier who ended up uh, getting them access to the Russian court. Then Colonel Delafield is sitting down. He was a major, I think, when that photo was taken. And then this little junior officer, and you can tell he's a junior officer because he's got just the frock coat with the single row of buttons. He is uh, Captain George Brinton McClellan. 
who was selected uh, to go on this commission. And later on, Robert E. Lee uh, said he regrets not having gone on this commission because all of these guys became, uh, overnight, they became, uh, even before they left, everyone in the United States military circles knew these guys are going over there. They're going to see the latest and greatest. They're going to be the subject matter experts on all things war when they get back. Uh, but they were sent over there. There's that need to stay abreast with what's going on overseas. The American military is kind of unique in that we look around the world and we pick and choose and borrow what we want our military to do. Um, we're not ashamed to borrow from other countries. So we have uh, our personnel structure is British. So our professional NCO Corps, where we have sergeants and corporals who are professionals, they're not just drafted, do two years in the Army, and off they go. They stay in the Army for several years. They're highly, highly competent, highly professional. We get that from the British. The British had a volunteer professional army. And our command and control system is German which is a mission command. Uh, the Germans called it Auftragstaktik. We stole it from the Germans after World War II. So we have a British personnel system next to a German command and control system. Mix those together, we got the US Army. Anyway, we don't want to ignore what's going on in the Crimea because we know technology is changing super, super fast. Uh, if, if we don't stay abreast of what's going on, we could end up we could end up being caught like the Russians are, unprepared and facing this new technology. And Jefferson Davis wrote a, if, if you ever get a chance to read it, his list of things they're supposed to study. He's got all these things, study this, study this, report back on this, report back on this, report back on uh, troop ships. And then Jefferson Davis's pet thing was camels. He was very keen to see if camels were being used to haul supplies and he wanted to take camels and put them out in the West and use them uh, in the Western United States. Uh, so the commission leaves, uh, I, I want to say, off the top of my head, I know it was 1855. I can't remember exactly when, unless I said it. They're either April or May of 1855. They first go to England uh, as a stopping off point. They meet Queen Victoria. Uh, McClellan call, called that humbug. But they're not interested in the British. Uh, they should have been. They're obsessed with all things French. They want to get permission from the French to go to the Crimea to visit the French trench sections. And the British, while they're in London, the British say, oh, yeah, you can come we'll get on the ship right now. We'll take you to our sections of the trench in Crimea. Yeah, sure, no problem. We don't care. They, uh, the Delafield Commission was not interested. They said, we want to go see the French. So the British are like, all right, well, off you go then. So they go to France. And their Emperor Napoleon III, who uh, McClellan was far more intrigued with, um, said, oh, sure, yeah, fine, you can go visit our, our siege lines, and turned it over to the French bureaucratic staff, and that went nowhere. It just went into some Kafka-esque bureaucratic wormhole, and we could not, they're sitting there waiting, 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 time's going by, and at the end, they still don't have permission to make it to the French lines. So they think, well, if we're stuck, if we can't make it to the French lines, well, let's go to the Russian lines. Meanwhile, the British are still saying, oh, come on over to our section. That's fine. But they don't want to see the British. They start going to the French. They go to Prussia. They meet uh, King Wilhelm I of Prussia. And that's when they were introduced to that Russian officer you saw in the previous photo. And he said, oh, sure, come on back to Russia. I'll introduce you to all the royalty, and then we'll get you in to see the Russian siege line. So they go to Russia. They see the French uh, fortifications at Kronstadt. They meet the Tsar, and they get uh, tentative permission. The Tsar says, OK, fine. But then the Russian officers say, wait a minute. These guys were just in France and in Britain. If they go to our siege lines, they might go back and tell the French and British what they saw. So the Russians then remove their permission for them to go see the siege lines. Finally, after all of this, this is why uh, Major Mordecai called this thing the ridiculous failure. They finally decide, well, well, we'll just go to the British lines, if nothing else. Finally, we'll just go. So they go to Constantinople, get on a steamship. Oh, they go through Austria, meet all the Austrian royalty there, too. And American officers in Europe, the American army at this point was only about 12,000 soldiers. It's tiny. Uh, 
So if you're in a European country and you there's three American officers, that's like incredibly rare. You are instant celebrities. So these guys are being wined and dined all over the place. But they finally decide, we'll go to the British section of the line if we can't go anywhere else. We might as well see something. And they board the steamship and they land in Crimea a few days after the Russians surrendered. So the war, for all intents and purposes, is over by the time that they actually arrive. But it was still a interesting uh, visit. Uh, McClellan, while he was in Austria, just, he's a cavalry officer, and he noticed a saddle that the Austrian army, the Hungarians, were using. And he noticed the design, and that went on to become uh, the impetus for him designing the famous McClellan saddle. And Major Mordecai, while he was in France, noticed this really spiffy bronze 12-pounder gun that the French were rolling around with. And that ended up being adopted as the model 1857 Napoleon, which we, after the French um, in the American Civil War. So they did bring a bunch of stuff back. Once they got back, these officers were immediately tasked out to other duties, and it took them a long time to write their official reports. So a lot of the stuff that they saw and they reported on, by the time they actually wrote it down and it was published and it was disseminated, it was several years old. And technology is changing so fast that the cutting edge stuff in 1854 is kind of trending obsolete by 1861. So the, the Crimean um, Commission was not as fruitful as it probably could have been if they had just gone to see the British lines to start with. But McClellan is interesting, uh, and I spotlight McClellan here because he goes to Crimea after the war is over, and he sees the aftermath. Uh, what did I? He wrote home, and he says, you cannot imagine the scene of destruction uh, touring the earthworks, and the power and the size of these earthworks left a real stamp on him. And he's talking to the British and French officers there, and they said, yeah, no, we, without this heavy preliminary artillery bombardment, we could not assault and overtake these works. So that kind of sticks with him. He sees the rifles, he sees the trenches, the, the steamships, the railroads, the logistical side of war. And he takes that with him when six years later, I think he was like 34 when he assumed command of the Army of the Potomac, something like 34, 35. So now he is in charge of the Army of the Potomac come 1862. And the, the war had stagnated uh, after the early Battle of Bull Run in the east. There's still some stuff moving on in the west. But out in the east, you've got the Confederates still around Manassas, the Centerville, Fairfax area. And they have built massive Sevastopol-sized entrenchments there, blocking the advance from Washington down to Richmond. So McClellan is not about to launch an attack into these massive Confederate earthworks. But he remembers that the French and the British took their armies, put them on ships, used their command of the sea to move the army all the way through the Mediterranean Sea, through the Black Sea, and land in the Crimea, and fight and defeat the Russians using uh, sea power. He doesn't have to go anywhere near as far as the French and the British did. He just has to get down to Fort Monroe, and his plan, and you got to give him credit, it's a good plan, as, as many plans are, completely flank all those massive Confederate earthworks and use the Union Navy's overwhelming uh, ability to move down and then will come up the back door into Richmond, up the York James Peninsula. So a brilliant plan, but McClellan, kind of being McClellan, He's, he organized the army very, very well. You can, he learned a lot of logistical lessons from Crimea. So excellent organization. The soldiers love him. He's very popular. The soldiers trust him because they know he is not going to waste our lives hurling us into these Confederate trenches. Uh, so he's, he's popular in that regard. But like uh, the ghost of Sebastopol is still haunting him. So he moves up the York James Peninsula and he encounters the Warwick line and uh, a very sparsely uh, held Confederate defensive position. Uh, Magruder went to great lengths. That guy is one of the unsung uh, brilliant leaders of the war. He takes his, I want to say he had 16,000 men here, and McClellan has 100,000. 
And Magruder, uh, Magruder has them switching hats and switching flags, switching their uniforms, and as they march in circles back and forth in front of the Union officers, counting regimental flags. And it makes it seem like the Confederates have far more troops than they have. And they also have ample earthworks that they've had time to prepare. They, they built some dams. They dammed up the river. They put trenches up around the old battlefield at Yorktown, which was the, the 1780s siege. And McClellan does not want to assault these works. And he can't flank it because there's this little Confederate uh, basically uh, iron cased floating battery that the Confederates called a warship with uh, a little bit of a stretch. That thing still exists. Even though the monitor by this time is here, it's still afloat, it's still a threat. So he doesn't want to load his army onto troop ships and try to get around Yorktown. So McClellan settles down to bring up his siege artillery. He says, I am going to reduce Yorktown the same way that the British and the French reduced. Sevastopol. I'm just going to shell them into oblivion, and then I will assault. And it takes him about a month to bring up his heavy guns. He builds his emplacements. He gets everything all ready. And the day before he's ready to start his bombardment, the Confederates fall back. They just abandon the works and move further up the peninsula. So his good idea, the good idea, Ferry, of move your army around the Confederate trenches and use, uh, use the example from the Crimean War to come in through the back door, Really good idea, but because he was so slow in execution, and historians have chewed on this literally since the day it was happening. Uh, you've got your defenders of McClellan, and you've got the people who uh, criticize him. But for one reason or another, he did not assault. It took him a month at Yorktown. And of course, this culminates with uh, the Confederates by the skin of their teeth mounting a defense at the seven days. And so he does not make it to Richmond and you know we know how the, the rest of the story goes but the Crimean War tech what was introduced and seen for the first time in the Crimean War uh, we're all very familiar with from the Civil War so it's the first uh, the Crimean War was the first war where the telegraph was used it's the first war that was photographed it's the first war that had ironclads the first war that had uh, in combat exploding shell guns being used the first war where the rifle profoundly influenced battlefield tactics, and it's the first war where railroads turned logistics upside down. In, uh, from the most ancient Babylonian armies through the Romans, through the Middle Ages, through Napoleon, all the way to the 1830s, armies moved at about three miles an hour. And suddenly you get to the 1850s and then 1860s, our civil war, now you, you have officers who were, when they joined the army, there were no railroads. And now you have Lee putting Longstreet's Corps on railroads and moving them hundreds of miles from one theater to another theater rapidly. This had never been done before. Uh, it's, it's all completely new. Your interior lines can now be longer, um, or your exterior lines can be shorter than interior lines and vice versa because of, of railroads. And all of this came uh, to uh, maturity in, in, in the Civil War. So this technology, which appeared in the Crimea, we end up seeing um, brought, I guess, to the next step in the American Civil War. And we looked back to what went on in Crimea to gauge what is, what's going to work. Uh, like McClellan, I don't want to assault earthworks. Well, you can't. You, Grant took the philosophy later, like, you're not going to win the war by just watching them. You're going to have to assault them sooner or later. Uh, but the, the echoes of Crimea uh, resound through our civil war. And uh, a, 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 wide, a, a wide and intense influence. Uh, this is just kind of a summary, a lot of text up there, but just a summary of what we talked about. Uh, but both north and south, throughout the Civil War were keenly aware of the dangers of being left behind because they saw what happened to Russia. Russia was left behind technologically and the Allies were able to defeat them. So both sides, and the, the, the Hunley here, the, that they just, you just gave away uh, the, the model earlier, that's a piece of real uh, Civil War innovation. One of the few things that you didn't really see in the Crimean War, there, there were no submarines, but we are thinking up 
how do we now get around this paradigm? The Union Army, or the Union Navy rather, has all of these ironclads. The Navy's just cranking them out. Well, how do we defeat them? Our ironclads don't have the steam engine. They don't have the power. We don't have the, the strength of artillery. We can't roll the iron armor plate to build our own ironclads to go out and fight them. But we can build this submarine and put it around under the water and take them out that way. So both sides very keenly interested in not being left behind and the, the reverberations from Crimea, both of the example for what to do, how to sustain armies and, and field much larger armies, move them faster, and what not to do, were in the case of the, of the Russians, not adopting the rifle, sticking with the older column-based Napoleonic tactics and of course, earthworks. By 1863, 64, that came uh, to dominate the face of, of civil war combat. And so in the, you could argue uh, Petersburg was essentially another uh, siege of Sevastopol, where there, there were no more stand-up battles. Both sides realized this is, it's coming down to uh, entrenchments. Okay. How, how was I for time? Did I? Because I can talk about this all day long, trust me. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.